Awesome. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Guriel. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a uh, career engagement uh, associate director of career engagement here for career success. Um, and I currently do um, a lot of our pre-health advising for uh, students at UCSC. Today, specifically, I'll be talking about the medical school timeline um, and really kind of factors to consider as you're uh, considering this as an option, just giving you an overview and some tips uh, while you're still a student to really prepare for this. Um, at any point, honestly, please feel free to ask questions. Um, you can just drop them in the chat um, and I will regularly be looking at that as well. Um, so for today, as I mentioned, I'll give a brief overview of the um, timeline to become a physician, but then I'll also be looking specifically at the timeline for the application process for med school. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about just factors to consider for being a strong applicant. Um, and then I'll talk about strategies for you to develop a plan um, so that by the time you do apply, you are a strong candidate. And as I mentioned, um, please feel free to ask questions at any point throughout the presentation. You can utilize the chat, or if you feel comfortable, you can um, unmute yourself and also just ask your question as well. So here's just a very broad overview of the very general timeline of becoming a physician, right? So um, essentially, it's going to be your pre-health gears, um, which essentially include any of your undergraduate years. Um, and any experience or gap years that you may be doing, um, really kind of the main things that you'll be doing during your pre-health years, which is for you all probably what you're doing now, is completing any prerequisites that are needed to get into medical school. Um, and it's also a time where you're going to be um, obtaining experiences one, to confirm that this is the profession that you ultimately want to do, and also for you to be able to be prepared once you do get into med school. Once you do get into med school, it's going to be a four-year process. Um, typically, the first two years of medical school are focused on coursework, um, and the last two years of your medical school um, is typically focused on what they call clinical clerkships or rotations where you're actually getting some more hands-on experiences. Um, looking at the medical license exam. So in order to be able to practice medicines, you essentially have to do like, it's three different steps overall that you have to do for your medical licensing. So two of them you'll do while you're still in med school. Um, and the third part you'll do like while you're doing residency, right? So after you complete the four years of uh, med school, then you go on to do a residency program, um, which a residency program, it's essentially a training program for recent graduates. Um, during this time, you'll basically be, um, you'll work as a physician under supervision, um, and the time here really varies. It's approximately three to seven years. It really depends on like what specialty you're going into, uh, which determines like how long your residency will ultimately be. At that point, um, after you complete your residency, um, including that, as I mentioned, that third and final part of the medical licensing exam, then you'll be fully licensed uh, to be able to practice medicine without any supervision. Um, optionally, if you want to continue to advance um, in the profession, um, you can opt into doing a fellowship uh, for a very specific specialty. And again, those can really range anywhere between like a year to three years. So just wanted to provide a very broad overview of what it's like to become a physician. Um, and now I'm going to focus um, specifically on the timeline of the actual application cycle. So here's a um, overview of the application timeline. Um, the key thing to note here is it's a long process. Um, so kind of really working backwards on here um, is you'll see med schools for the most part um, 
will begin during the fall every year. So like typically once a year. Um, today I'm gonna primarily be focusing on like resources for like if you're doing MD or DO schools uh, within the US. There's other international schools, Caribbean schools that their timeline slightly is different because they have more kind of year round applications that they do. But today I'll particularly focus on like MD and DO schools within the US because that's typically the most common uh, places that folks typically apply to. Um, so with that being said, again, they start once a year in the fall, July, August, depending on what specific score you're looking at. So if you go backwards, really, and you see the very beginning of like the application cycle, it's going to be in the beginning of May. So there we're looking at like 14, 15 month process, right? Of I typically consider this the application year, but as you can see, it's a little bit longer than an actual, um, than an actual year. Things that happen here is I have kind of different sections, right? So there's primary applications, secondary applications, um, interviews are basically kind of the three major steps in the application process, and then also the acceptance. Um, as you notice, there's a lot of overlap too, just in kind of one when these things happen, and there's not like a very clear like start and end date, and then immediately followed by the next step. There's a lot of overlap. And part of that is because for med schools and a lot of the health professional programs, um, schools utilize um, rolling admissions. Um, what that basically means is that a lot of schools have deadlines um, that kind of range from like October through December of what you'll see kind of posted on their website of like, this is our application deadline, right? Um, but really with rolling admissions, it basically means that they don't wait until those deadlines to start their application review process. So then with that context in mind, if we kind of go to the beginning here, applications typically be open like the first week of May um, and you essentially get like a month to fill out the applications um, and work on them. And then typically the earliest that you can start applying for applications um, it's typically like the last week of May or the first week of June. So essentially you have a month to start filling it out. Um, and then typically in this time period here is when you can start submitting your primary application. And I'll go a little bit more into detail in the next slides of like what components go into each of these sections here. Um, but really like as soon as you start like being able to submit your applications here, what I typically recommend is like aiming to really try to have your application material submitted within the first couple of months of when the application starts. Um, so for most folks, I say aim to have your application done like no later than like August to really have the best kind of chance to be considered, right? Because as you can see here, if you kind of are waiting till August, you'll see that schools will already start reviewing secondary applications as early as July. So you don't want to wait too late, right? Because again, with rolling admissions, uh, and you can see kind of down here with the acceptance, right? Like schools will start accepting students as early as October. So the longer that you wait in the application process, the fewer and fewer spots that are going to typically be available. Um, so it just becomes a lot more difficult the longer that you wait. Um, I'm going to dive into a little bit more here on kind of each of the components. Um, so the primary application, um, this typically going to be like centralized applications. Um, so again, focusing in the U.S. and um, or within the U.S., there's really kind of three different application, uh, centralized application services that you'll want to keep in mind. So Pretty much most MD programs um, in the US utilize AMCAS, which is the name of like the application service. Um, the few exceptions are going to be a few in Texas that utilize a different service called uh, TMD SAS. Um, and then if you're considering doing um, osteopathic uh, medicine or DO, um, then you're going to want to be utilizing the ACOMAS. So 
overall, like a lot, of, regardless of which one of these you end up utilizing, the resources that I shared today are all still going to be super relevant. Um, there's just very, very slight differences in like when you can start applying for each of them. But again, everything here is going to be super applicable to whichever of those routes that you ultimately want to do. Um, as I mentioned before, you typically want to have your primary application submitted by the end of August. Um, it's not impossible to get in after August. It just becomes more challenging. The main components that are going to be involved in the primary application are going to be your personal statement, which is really going to be focused on like, why are you interested in uh, medicine? Um, you're going to have the opportunity to summarize your experiences um, for like the ACOMAS, uh, sorry, the MD programs. You have up to 15 different experiences that you can utilize to be able to like highlight your experiences. Um, this is where you will have to insert all of the grades um, and your coursework that you've done as a college student. So this will have to include any classwork that you've done for college or university. So like if you're a transfer student, you will include your um, community college stuff. Uh, for some folks that end up doing more coursework after they graduate with their bachelor's um, to help uh, complete any prerequisites, all of those uh, courses, you're going to have to get official transcripts and enter all that information into the system. Um, and then the last major thing on here is you'll have to start identifying like the names and email address of the letter of recommendation writers. So at this point, you don't have to have your letters submitted. You just have to start identifying like who those folks are that will ultimately write you letters of recommendation. Um, the way that letters of recommendation work for students at UCSC is you'll have to work on getting individual letters um, from each individual person you want to have a letter. Typically, it's recommended to have three to five letter writers overall. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but you'll just have to double check with each school exactly like how many letters they actually want because it's going to vary a little slightly depending on each individual school. So here you just identify who they are, their email address. This will trigger an email address to those individuals and they'll get clear instructions on like how they would submit uh, the letters on your behalf. So it's all kind of automated. For the secondary application, um, this is where it's going to vary a little bit. So with the primary applications, you basically do one application. At the end of the application, you get to select which medical schools do you want your application to be sent to. And then that's where you start identifying what schools you want to apply to. Um, but it's just one application for all of the schools. With the secondary applications, um, this one's going to be different because this is where then like schools will reach out to you individually to ask you to submit uh, supplemental material for your application. So things vary a little bit because every school, again, will have slightly different criteria and ways that they go about this. Some schools will just by default ask all applicants to submit secondary material. Other schools will look at some of your information from your first, your primary application and will only invite a limited number of students to submit secondary applications. Um, if you do get an invitation to do secondary applications, the recommendation is to try to have those submitted within like two weeks of the invitation. But again, you also want to read closely like the instructions because some schools will have very clear timelines um, of when you want to do this. But Generally, it's about two weeks after the invitation you want to submit these. Um, and this is where you want to keep in mind that, like, by the time you submit your secondary applications, that's the time where you definitely want to have your letters of recommendation submitted because at this step is when, like, schools start looking at your overall applications. Um, so if you any of your letters are being delayed, it's going to completely, like, delay your process until those letters are done. So just keep that in mind. Um, the main thing that's typically asked in the secondary materials is really typically like essay questions focus on like, 
why are you applying to that specific program? Um, whereas again, the primary application, your personal statement just typically focuses on like why you want to go into medicine and like why do you want to be a physician? Um, at that point, you don't really want to be specific to any particular school. In the secondary application material, that's where you want to be very specific and be able to clearly articulate why you're applying to each individual school. And then for the third part is interviews. For interviews, there's different formats, different structures. So most programs at this point have transitioned to be um, fully virtual interviews. Uh, but what that means is, uh, is a little bit different for each school. Some of them will be live interviews or live virtual. So basically similar to like what we're doing now, you're able to connect and actually like talk to somebody in real time. Other ones are gonna be asynchronous, which is essentially you're gonna log into the system or platform that they utilize. They're just gonna have questions and you're essentially recording your responses and submitting that. You don't actually get to like meet with somebody in real time. So those are the different um, formats typically of like how med school interviews are happening. And then the structure of each of them will be slightly different. Um, and this is typically like for the live um, virtual interviews. Um, so it could happen that some schools do like one-on-one -on -one interviews. So that's basically one applicant connecting directly with one person from the med school that you're applying to. Um, you could be asked to do a group interview um, where it's basically multiple applicants that are applying for med school are all put together in kind of like the same virtual room and they all kind of get asked. They're basically all doing the interview together. A panel interview is where you have the applicant. So you by yourself will be meeting with multiple folks from the med school uh, and they'll be asking you different questions. And then multiple mini interviews or MMIs is essentially you'll meet with one person. They'll typically ask like a question or a small set of questions. Then you'll get transferred over to like another person or set of people. And they typically ask different questions. And that's why it's kind of multiple mini interviews. So now um, just want to pause for a moment. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the timeline of just being a physician overall or any questions on the application timeline before I jump into kind of like uh, some of the preparation stuff. Okay, not seeing any questions, I'll continue. So really kind of the main thing that you'll wanna start doing is start really reflecting on like, why are you interested in going into health profession, specifically becoming a physician, right? So as I mentioned before, your personal statement will ask you about like, why do you want to be a doctor or why do you want to be going to medicine or why do you want to be a physician, right? So you want to start being able to get comfortable talking about like, why you specifically want to be a physician, right? So this is going to have to go beyond just saying things like, I've always wanted to be a doctor, or um, I always want to help people. And like, I love science, which is great. But like, those are typically common things that like all applicants will already have, right? So um, you want to be able to be comfortable and really be able to go into specifics reasons of like why. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is really what the main focus of your personal statement will be in your application. Um, what I highly encourage folks to do is like, especially as you're a student still, um, or even if you're a recent alumni is starting to connect with healthcare professionals, um, and really start asking them like what their day-to-day -day really is like, right? Um, if you can also like doing shadowing experiences, doing clinical experiences. So as basically as much as you can, like start getting familiar with like, what does a physician do that is different from like a physician assistant or a PA or like a nurse practitioner, right? Like you want to start getting familiar with like, what are the differences? 
one so that you can also know like what are other potential health professions that may potentially meet what you trying to get out of um, this type of um, career path. Um, I have on here to connect with alumni, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a really great resource to be able to network with um, with alumni. So I highly encourage utilizing that resource. Um, so next, as you're like thinking about like being a strong applicant, you'll want to get super familiar with the core competencies. So the AAMC, um, which is the association that um, basically oversees the MD applications and the MCAT, they have a bunch of resources on their website. Highly encourage going to their website, get familiar with their resources. Um, essentially, one of the resources that they have is 15 core competencies. So basically, med school admissions have gotten together and they basically outline like, these are the 15 key things that admissions are going to be looking for overall in your application for a strong candidate. So they're broadly kind of like um, put into like four different categories, interpersonal, intrapersonal, thinking and reasoning and sciences. But really on the right hand side, here's the list of the 15 different skills. Um, and again, we'll share this recording and the slides as well. So you don't have to feel like you're writing all these down, but you want to start getting familiar like with what are all these skills and then ideally start reflecting on like um, your experiences that you've done to help you identify like which skills have you already developed and also reflecting on that will help you identify like what skills you can continue to develop by the time you actually apply for med school. But this is a really important thing that uh, you should get familiar with. Um, Another common thing that comes up is experiences. So really with experiences, this is a great opportunity for you, again, to help you confirm your interest in the profession, right? So um, being able to get experiences within the healthcare setting is gonna be helpful, again, just to get familiar with what the day-to-day -day is like and just get familiar with like, is this something that you truly want to do um, as your career path. As you're then reflecting on your experiences, the also also the other thing is that like not necessarily all of your experiences have to be in a clinical or healthcare setting. Um, so you'll want to basically have diverse experiences overall. Um, one thing I do want to note is just clarifying specifically for clinical experiences. Something to keep in mind if you're interested in getting clinical experiences is you will need additional training and a license to be able to actually do hands-on experiences with patients. Um, I think that's something that's not super commonly known or fully well understood by folks. So just wanted to clarify that, that specifically what schools are considering clinical experiences are those like one-on-one -on -one direct uh, patient experiences and just knowing that you do need to get additional training and be licensed for those, right? So common experiences um, include like being an EMT, right? So emergency medical technician, being a nursing assistant, um, being a medical assistant, a scribe are all like common things that you can consider doing uh, that will provide you the type of experiences. Uh, prerequisites. So a lot of schools will have prerequisite courses that you'll need to do in order to be eligible to um, their medical schools. Um, but the number one thing I have on here is like, always make sure to verify the requirements for each of the specific schools that you ultimately want to apply to, uh, because each school is going to vary slightly of what their prerequisites are. So don't just assume that like, if you are familiar with the prerequisites of one school that that is automatically going to make you eligible for every single med school so you're just going to have to get familiar with like um, researching each of the schools that you're considering applying to and just getting familiar with what their prerequisites are i have a list here of like some common prerequisite courses but again don't be like just because i see this that i'm all automatically going to be um uh, qualified for every school or meet every school's criteria. 
So it's typically a year of general biology, a year of general chemistry, a year of organic chemistry and biochemistry together, right? Um, one thing is at UCSC, uh, our organic chemistry um, series is, it's a two core series, um, but it's really meant to cover the material of like a full year's worth of chemistry. But I like to clarify that because some folks think that they need to do three specific quarters of organic chemistry and it's not always true. For the most part, it's not true. And again, you'll see this as you specifically read the prerequisites of each specific schools. A lot of schools, as you start reading their requirements, you'll realize that they kind of group biochemistry and organic chemistry together. So my recommendation is typically to do the two quarters of organic chemistry plus a quarter of biochemistry. Um, typically, you'll want to do one year of math. Um, I have on here calculus. I have on there specifically calculus because that's a prerequisite course to get into our physics series here at UCSC. Um, but schools don't necessarily need you to have calculus as your math. You can utilize other math courses to help meet that prerequisite, but just highlight calculus because it is a prereq here at UCSC to get into physics. Um, and then typically a quarter of psychology and sociology. So the other thing is like, as you start getting familiar with some of the other requirements like the MCAT, you'll realize that a reason that the, these particular classes are also prerequisites is because these are also the subject matter that's going to be covered in the MCAT. So like taking these courses is also going to be helping you prepare for the MCAT when you ultimately need to do that. Which is the next thing that I have on here. So the MCAT is basically the standardized exam for med schools. Um, it's going to be a super important factor along with your GPA courses um, as schools are considering you for admissions. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that there is a fee assistance program offered by the AAMC, so highly encourage folks to look into that. Um, it's a really great program, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a further slide. Um, but as you're looking at, I have this table again, again, I'm sharing the slide. So I know this is really hard to probably see as on the screen now, but, um, I've also linked the source of this, but it's really looking at MCAT scores on the top. It's looking at GPAs on the, going down into the different rows here. And it kind of just helps you understand, right? That like, just because you have a super high like MCAT score by itself doesn't necessarily mean that your GPA is can be whatever, right? So I like to share this just to sh emphasize so that like as you're assessing yourself, you can have a general idea. Also understanding that this is an overall average of like all the different schools, but then each individual school has very specific ranges. But I think this, this is sometimes helpful for the folks to see just kind of like how GPAs and MCATs are kind of analyzed together. Any questions on that stuff before I kind of, I'll talk about similar things, but more kind of action items which eat with each of these things. Okay. So as I mentioned, right, like you want to start getting familiar with like, why specifically do you want to be a physician and not like a PA or like a nurse assistant, right? Or um, sorry, a nurse practitioner. So we have a worksheet on our website. If you click on this link, it will give you the option to download a copy of this into your own um, Google Drive. It's essentially various questions that are related just to like career related questions. It has some questions of like, just for you to help you reflect and be able to like clearly articulate like why this profession is what you want to pursue. With prerequisites, um, you want to make sure that, again, you do research on the specific schools that you're considering applying to. Just get familiar with what their prerequisites are. Um, I highly encourage you like start creating like a spreadsheet 
that like at least hyperlinks or you can even start putting them in that spreadsheet of like what are all the requirements for the schools that you're applying to just to kind of help you track that. Um, what it's going to be super important too is for you to meet with your academic or your major advisors to be able to map out an academic plan for you that helps you just understand like what are the requirements that you need specifically for the major that you're doing but then also to see like how you can fit some of these prerequisite courses into your overall academic plan. Um, with that being said too, um, to go into med school, you can major in any major as um, there's not like a specific major that you need to go into med school. So um, if you're a science, non-science, if you're a social science or engineering student or whatever your major is, it doesn't really matter. Um, the main thing is as long as you are able to meet the prerequisite courses. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, classes can also be taken at other colleges after you graduate, right? So this is kind of a common thing that I'll see with like students who basically are like non-science or non-biology students. Um, a lot of like biology or science students are able to typically meet a lot of their prerequisites with their major just because there's a lot more alignment with the prerequisite courses that are needed for med school and like the majors that they're doing. But again, it's not a requirement to go down that route. Um, if you're in a different major and you're not able to fit all of the prerequisite courses into your academic plan before you graduate, like that's also totally fine. Like again, you can still go into med school eventually. You'll just have to do some of the classes after you graduate. Um, typically what folks end up doing is like doing those additional courses at like a community community college. As I mentioned before, the core competencies are going to be super important. Um, again, I have another worksheet on our website here um, where it really is going to help you self-assess um, each of the 15 core competencies. Um, it's really structured for you to be able to like reflect on your previous experiences because I think a lot of folks are typically surprised to realize like, how many experiences they've already had that can really help them demonstrate these skills. Because again, not necessarily all of your um, experiences have to be in a healthcare or a clinical setting. Um, so going through this assessment is going to really be helpful for you to kind of just identify the things that you already have developed. But then it's also super helpful for you to identify like what are some areas of it of growth, right? So like, what are some of those competencies that you can still continue to develop, right? And once you identify those, then you can utilize those as a basis to really like help you create a map of like future experiences that are gonna help you develop those core competencies. Um, so yeah, I typically like to, as I'm having conversations with folks, is start working together with the, your core competencies and your experiences. And really you should be kind of doing that hand in hand. Um, when it comes down to experiences, um, as your student still, like I highly encourage you to like prioritize your academics. So that basically means is like, if you have the resources, if you have the bandwidth to do like additional experiences out of your classes, like definitely go for it and do it. Here is where it's really gonna vary for each individual student. Um, every individual student's path is gonna be completely different and that's totally okay. Um, Cause ultimately you're all gonna have the same end goal, right? Uh, but really what I mean by prioritize your academics is don't try to spread yourself too thin where like if you're trying to do like a volunteering experience or a shattering experience, or if you're already certified and licensed to do some of those clinical experiences, right? Like just be mindful of how those experiences are impacting your grades, right? Um, if you realize that you're like not having as much study time as you would like to be able to like get really good grades, then that's why I would recommend like maybe take a moment to kind of reflect if it makes sense for you to continue doing those experiences while you're still a student, right? Because 
ultimately like your GPA is going to be a very important factor in your um, candidacy. And like, once you graduate, like there's not much you can do with your GPA. It's more or less set. So I mentioned before, like you can definitely still do some courses after you graduate, but like at that point, just because you've accumulated so many credits and units um, that like getting straight A's in like maybe three or four classes is probably not going to significantly change your GPA at that point. So, so I always recommend as a student, always prioritize your academics because you'll still have time afterwards to be able to gain more experiences. Um, so with that in mind, um, I highly encourage folks to really consider experience or gap years. Um, this is really the norm for students to get into med school. So um, a couple of years ago, when was the last data that was available? So for like the students who got into MD programs, um, in a survey that they did as they got in is over 70% um, had mentioned that they had at least one gap year, if not more. So it's totally normal to have those experience or gap years. Um, and I highly encourage folks to make sure that you're really taking that as a serious option as you're preparing for during kind of your pre-health years. Um, and then really, again, like just finding opportunities that are really going to help you develop your core competency is going to be super important. Um, and then I mentioned this before, but like just be mindful that for clinical experiences, you do need to have additional training and licenses. Um, with the MCAT is just really get familiar with the content of the MCAT. And as I mentioned before, with a lot of the prerequisites, um, there's a lot of overlap in the prerequisites and like the content that's in the MCAT. So essentially I would think about like, as you're doing those classes, you're already basically studying for the MCAT. So um, just really get familiar. There's resources on the website, which I also have linked here on the slides um, for you to be able to see in depth, like what are the specific subjects and topics that are specifically in the MCAT and then there's more information on here as well for you to look into the fee assistance program. So if you qualify for the fee assistance program, um, essentially what you'll get is you'll get additional resources for MCAT prep courses. Um, sorry, not courses, just additional online resources to help you study. You will get a reduced MCAT registration fee. Um, You'll also get fee waivers for your for up to 20 MD schools applications. Um, and then you'll get a one-year subscription to um, the MSAR, which is the medical school requirements, um, academic requirements. It's essentially like the um, school directory for like MD med schools. Um, that's a really great tool that has a lot of information about each individual school. With that subscription, you can also see like GPA ranges for each individual med school of like the students that they actually accepted. So you can see ranges of like GPA scores, you can see um, science GPA scores, and you can also see the ranges for the MCAT scores. So that resource will really help you best kind of evaluate your candidacy, like once you know your GPA, once you know your MCAT score, you can utilize that resource to see like, do your metrics fall within the range of scores that they have actually accepted students in the past. So, so I, going back to like, again, look into the fee assistance program, it's super valuable. And then really kind of as, as we're wrapping up here is like, as you're thinking about like when to apply, I always say, apply when you feel like you're a strong candidate, right? So we looked at the overall like timeline of being a physician, right? The four years, four, at least four years of pre-health, um, the four years of being in med school, the three to seven years of residency, right? Like medical school is not going anywhere. It's going to be a super long journey. So like if you start now versus like in a year from now or in a couple of years, right? Like I always say like, 
just apply whenever you feel like you're a strong candidate because ideally you only want to go through this whole process once, right? So recommend don't rush it into it. Um, make sure you're utilizing those resources to be able to best assess your candidacy. Um, and then let's see here. Um, key things to keep in mind, right? When you're thinking about like, am I a strong candidacy is questions I ask folks to just reflect on is like, have you done the assessment on the core competencies? And do you feel like that you can strongly demonstrate all 15 of those competencies, right? Um, thinking about like, are the programs that you're applying specifically, do they align with your specific career goals, right? And then do your metrics, right? Like your GPA, your um, MCAT scores, do they align with the specific programs that you're applying to? And if the answer to all those is yes, then you're probably going to be a strong candidate. Um, if any of them are no, then that's when I would suggest like reflect on why you think some of those things are and if it makes sense for you to maybe take a pause and then start identifying like what you can do between now and maybe the next application cycle to see if you can kind of implement those things and become a stronger candidate for the next cycle. Um, so once you identify like which application year, like you're definitely gonna be a strong candidate for, um, things I suggest to do is typically like in the winter, so like January of the application cycle, right? Like thinking back to the whole timeline where the applications open up in early May is, you should really start prepping like months in advance. So I typically suggest like starting in January is when you should already start um, drafting your personal statement. And again, a lot of these I say begin, but like if you start earlier, even better. But the latest you should start considering starting is typically like around January, but start drafting your personal statement. Again, a lot of them are really gonna be focused on like, why are you interested in going into med school? Um, start identifying your letter of recommender writers. So again, at this point, you don't need them to have the letters written yet. You just need to be able to start having those conversations with um, those folks to make sure that they're going to be available to write you strong letters. Um, and then start drafting summaries of your experiences, right? So I talked about um, having the opportunity to talk about 15 different experiences, and you'll want to be able to really, the clear thing there is highlighting what are the skills or the competencies that you developed in those experiences and how you feel like those are going to help you in med school and ultimately becoming a physician. Um, and then I think this is the last major thing I have on here is um, common thing that I get is like which schools to apply to, right? So that is really going to be up to each individual person to um, think about, right? And just some factors to keep in mind, right, is like, um, what is the school's mission and do they align with what your specific values are, right? Um, looking at your overall metrics and thinking about like, do your metrics align with like what typically the schools accept for each of the ones that you're considering? Um, things to take into account is the overall cost, right, of like the applications, but then of like med school overall. Uh, location is going to be a big factor, right? Like um, I have on here looking at in-state versus out-of-state, also looking is it a public versus a private school, right? Those are all factors that go into like the cost and obviously the location, right? So things to keep in mind is typically public schools will have a stronger, um, they typically will accept a greater proportion of in-state um, applicants just because of public funds. And again, this is where utilizing a tool like the MSAR, which is the school directory, you can see data on that as well, of like what percentage of students or uh, candidates get accepted that are considered in-state versus out-of-state. And you can clearly sometimes see like very clear like preferences for in-state versus out-of-state. So that's helpful for you to definitely keep in mind as you're looking to that. Private schools usually don't have that restriction. So they're typically like evenly split, like 50-50 more or less of like the candidates that they accept. But those are just some of the factors to keep into consideration. Um, some resources that we have available. So um, 
we have both peer drop-ins available. We also have one-on-one -on -one coaching available. So um, we have both virtual and in-person opportunities for you to be able to get resources um, for our one-on-one -on -one coaching appointments. Um, it is also available to recent alumni. So you have access to our coaching appointments for up to two years, even after you graduate. Um, to find our resources, you can go to our website um, and then clicking down on the student resources um, section is typically where you'll find like most of our information. Honestly, if you just Google like UCSC pre-health, it's probably like the easiest way to find resources to all of our pre-health resources as well.